So we are now um, starting the recording. Um, I wanted to briefly go through our agenda for today's session. Um, I am going to introduce our panelists um, and each of our panelists is going to provide us with a presentation. And then we were going to have some times um, for question and um, answers from the audience. So if you do have questions um, as the panelists are presenting, um, you can add those questions into the etherpad that I just linked into the Zoom chat um, so that we can get to those questions um, after the presentations. Um, we're going to end uh, with some time for some, um, some personal reflection and followed by a little bit um, of additional discussion to end the session. Um, so I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Stephanie Carroll and Jocelyn Lee as presenters for our keynote panel today. Uh, both Stephanie and Jocelyn sit on the Carpentries Equity Council and are supporting collaborative projects to develop new lessons for the Carpentries related to the topics that will be discussed during the panel today. A little more about them. Um, Dr. Stephanie Carroll is an Assistant Professor of Public Health, Associate Director for the Native Nations Institute, and Acting Director, Assistant Research Professor at the Udall Center at the University of Arizona. Her research group, the Collaboratory for Indigenous Data Governance, develops research, policy, and practice innovations for Indigenous data sovereignty. Stephanie chairs the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, the International Indigenous Data Sovereignty Interest Group at the Research Data Alliance, and the Indigenous Data Working Group for the IEEE P2890 Recommended Practice for Provenance of Indigenous Data's People, People's Data, sorry. Um, Dr. Jocelyn Lee is an assistant professor of biogeochemistry at Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado. Prior to her current appointment, she was a data science educator at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories DNA Learning Center and science education fellow at Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Her teaching experience in the areas of computational chemistry, biology, and data science skills has encouraged her to train bench scientists to better analyze their data. Jocelyn cares about training more American Indian, Alaska Native students in their communities in genomics in a culturally appropriate way. Um, before I turn it over to Stephanie for her presentation, I wanted to have everyone respond to a quick poll question. Um, we want to see who in the audience is already aware of the care principles for indigenous data governance. So I am going to bring up the poll here and give us all a little bit of time to respond to this question. So it looks like so far, um, most people are aware but have not applied them in their work. And we have some people that are not aware of the care principles. Okay, well, thanks everyone for um, providing responses to our question. And um, with that, I am going to turn it over um, to Stephanie to get us started. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here today. I'm gonna work on getting my slides up to share with you all. Um, and I'm on the screen just for a point here, but I, I'm going to um, hop off and um, save my internet so it's not quite as um, put in jeopardy. So um, it's good to be here. I'm really excited about this conversation, especially to be in conversation with Alicia and Jocelyn um, and um, really to move forward with the discussion with the carpentries. So let me figure out how to get this window off. Alicia, do you know how to get, and the, uh, hold on, let me close that. Okay, sorry. Excellent. So I'm really excited to hear that most people have um, heard about the care principles. Uh, we've been talking about them myself and many others who've um, participated in the design of the care principles over the past two years or so. Um, so uh, what we've been working on is um, 
initially just socializing their care principles. And then um, at this point working in how to operationalize the principles as well um, within different aspects of, um, of data environments such as uh, repositories or as a researcher and so forth. And then trying to figure out how to create um, and institutionalize criteria um, for the application of them. And so we think of the different criteria that are out there for the fair principles and stuff for assessing their use. Um, what might be similar criteria or um, new criteria for assessing the care principles. So see that at Nakastan, see that Stephanie Carroll to do stuff on Nakal China. Um, I am Stephanie Carroll. I'm Atna from the native village of Kudika along the Copper River in Alaska, and I'm also of Sicilian descent. Um, and I'm joining you from Tucson, now known as Tucson, Arizona, the land and territories which are home to the Otham and Yaqui peoples today. Um, and I will give you a brief tour of the care principles and how they're currently being implemented and some new horizons. And then um, Jocelyn will share um, more relevant information about um, her experiences as well as the carpentries and relating the, um, those two to what I'm talking about today. So I'm gonna begin by um, using a grounding story. Um, a lot of my work with indigenous data really spans across disciplines and sectors um, and communities. And so even though I'm trained as a public health scientist, um, I, I work a lot in um, uh, environmental arenas as well as um, in sociology and other places. So um, as part of her dissertation research, um, my collaboratory for indigenous data governance um, uh, colleague, Dr. Dominique David Chavez, developed a scale of levels of indigenous community engagement and research as many ways to assess for how researchers access indigenous knowledge systems and how they engage with the community members who maintain them. So this was adapted from its participatory agricultural research. And the framework really focuses on who holds authority and governance in the research process, ranging from no engagement on the left up through indigenous centered and indigenous led research on the right. So um, moving from an extractive to self-determined um, arena for research for indigenous peoples, um, what she looked at was a global systematic review analyzing 20 years of climate studies published through 2017 that included indigenous knowledges in their research. And so what she found was that 87% of the studies were extractive, really representing the colonial legacies where the projects didn't engage indigenous communities or use contractual or consultative relationships to extract knowledge from communities. Yet there were a handful of studies as well as grassroots community efforts that live on the self-determined end of the scale. So really the conversation then becomes, how do we move from um, uh, a place where we're, we're working in transactional colonial aspects, moving towards indigenous data um, and, in, and indigenous um, inspiration within data environments. So um, we wanna know then, how do we embed indigenous people's rights, interests, and expectations and responsibilities into the creation of information and knowledge infrastructures? And thinking about how do we enhance access to an indigenous governance of data within these infrastructures? So the overarching goal is to translate the ways that communities have for the care and use of their knowledge into the digital environment. So indigenous data sovereignty is the expression of the right of indigenous peoples to govern their data from collection and storage to use and reuse. It finds its foundations in inherent sovereignty. Only indigenous peoples as rights holders can exercise indigenous data sovereignty. Others, including repositories, can support indigenous data sovereignty by embedding indigenous data governance or the values, ways, traditions, and roles that community have for the care and use of their knowledge into data infrastructures, policies, and practices. So in response to the increased generation and use of data and open data, big data, open science and research environments and the concurrent limited opportunities for indigenous control, a network of indigenous scholars led the development of the care principles for indigenous data governance, which were then published by the Global Indigenous Data Alliance. These principles set forth critical considerations for non-tribal data creators, stewards and users, and really are designed to guide the inclusion of indigenous peoples in data governance and increase their access to and benefit from data. The care 
flexible shift the focus of data governance from consultation to values-based relationships and have been widely recognized as enriching the discussion of collective rights to data for other populations as well. So the care principles include four principles, each with three sub-principles. They are collective benefit, which details that data ecosystems shall be designed and function in ways that enable indigenous peoples as collectives to benefit from data. Authority to control, which emphasizes the need for those working with data to uphold indigenous peoples rights to and support their interests in data. Responsibility reminds us that those working with indigenous data must center indigenous people's self-determination and collective benefit and data relationships. Ethics then focuses on using indigenous people's ethics to guide decisions on harm, benefits, justice, and future use. So these really high level care principles direct those interacting with indigenous data toward community specific guidance for the care of knowledge. Um, while the care principles bring a people on purpose orientation to data governance, they complement the data centric nature of the popular fair principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Implementation of the care principles and fair principles together should be seen as necessary to allow indigenous peoples to govern, access, and use their data and to share on their own terms. The reason for that is that currently the vast majority of indigenous data ranging from ethnographic material to biological materials to earth observations to health data and so on are neither fair nor fair. These indigenous collections or indigenous data in other collections can be hard to find. They can be buried in large data sets, repositories, researcher possessions. Um, these indigenous data are often mislabeled, so they don't indicate the indigenous peoples who are related to those data and they're not searchable. And indigenous peoples largely are, are not the legal rights holders. Thus, indigenous collections and data are not fair and do not perpetuate indigenous provenance, protocols for use and sharing, or permission. So we're really concerned about implementing fair and care on already existing data, as well as instituting policies and practices to operationalize fair and care and the ongoing creation of new data that incorporates indigenous knowledge. Some of these tools to make this a reality include using indigenous people's own laws, policies and practices and investing in indigenous data systems. Updating other governments and institutions policies and practices is really another necessary step towards ethical inclusion of indigenous knowledge in external data systems. How do we then not only include indigenous knowledge, but also the relationships to people in place into science and technology. This requires those policy ethics and infrastructure to support indigenous rights to an indigenous data throughout the data life cycle and across the data ecosystem. We can strengthen such rights and responsibilities by making changes, even minimal at first, across data actors, such as research institutions, repositories, publishers, funders, researchers, and more. For instance, this begs us to consider how to retrofit, or even better, how to design repositories so they embed indigenous people's relationships to information and knowledge within cyber infrastructure and policies and practices. So in an agenda setting paper led by Maui Hudson um, out of um, the University of Waikato, we created, uh, that, was, that was created at the same time we were kind of vetting and, and truthing the care principles. We laid out a number of indigenous expectations for building trust, enhancing accountability and improving equity in science and research practices um, as, an, as a way and pathway to um, increasing not only um, indigenous representation and relationship to data, but um, indigenous practices of data within mainstream data systems. So um, I'll detail those that advance indigenous data sovereignty rights and implement indigenous data governance now. And so you see here, we laid out some of these, these um, pathways and they include things like um, plans for data access and secondary uses, um, appropriate study design, um, collecting appropriate cultural metadata and those things. And so some of the tools that have been moving forward um, to implement the care principles really um, address each of those points. So as we move into discussing some of the institutional and organizational responsibilities and recommendations in relation to indigenous data, it's really important to acknowledge that the, there's really no one size fits all approach. Um, and um, making small changes across environments and institutions really can create scaffolding that supports indigenous rights across those institutions. 
So the, the recommendations that follow emphasize op opportunities for institutional change and um, system, systems level improvements in policy and practice that we can put towards um, achieving near and long-term um, goals for implementing the care principles. And they are um, centering indigenous peoples, enriching metadata, recognizing indigenous intellectual property, protecting both personal and community identifiable information, formalizing guidelines and tracking data use and reuse. And then finally, thinking about advancing ethics as technology and data grow. So um, the first thing I'll talk about is centering indigenous peoples and leadership and scholarship. Um, and two points I wanna put across today about this are about using existing tribal expectations to set policy and then also seeking guidance from indigenous leadership and scholarship. One of my primary concerns when we think about implementing the care principles and drilling down to that community level guidance for um, data governance is that we're asking a lot of communities, whether they be indigenous or not. So what are tools that we can look to that already exist that give us what some of the expectations are within those communities? Um, you know, I like to talk about how the roles and responsibilities we have in communities um, as people and the relationships among us, um, we're trying to replicate those within digital, uh, within digital environments. Um, and so one of the things we can do is that a number of tribes have tribal research processes or tribal codes around research um, and other documents about responsibilities for conducting research on tribal lands. And so um, earlier this year, um, I co-authored a paper that uses um, tribal research codes to show how tribes are setting expectations around the care principles already and have been for sometimes decades. So for instance, um, when we're addressing um, the responsibility, the R in, in care, um, and it's sub principle number three, which is for indigenous languages and worldviews, this principle really provides the recognition and inclusion of indigenous data norms and practices throughout the research process. So it's really kind of pushing that and trying to, to say this is, this is the way that it should be done. And when we look at tribal research codes, I have two examples here. One is from the Kirk tribe, which says, the Kirk tribe is, asserts its age old tradition of reserving domains of knowledge for rightful and culturally appropriate owners, as well as restricting access to this knowledge during certain chronological periods as dictated by time honored Kirk law. Um, and so what that tells us is one of the ways that you might think through a digital infrastructure that you need to um, um, you need to mitigate for um, access and permissions to that data. So one way might be that this is only available during certain times of year um, and it's only available to certain people. So we're taking um, traditional roles and responsibilities and translating them into a digital environment. Another thing that we see expanded through um, indigenous expectations here is from the Ta-Nawatham Nation, their codes dictates that human subjects mean a living or non-living individual. And so we are paying um, and being responsible to our ancestors and understanding that, um, and when a researcher conducts research and they obtain information through an interaction with an individual um, or um, an ancestor, that that needs to be um, attended to in the rights and responsibilities um, for those data and for that information going forward. Um, another area that we've seen a lot of action in is in enriching metadata. Uh, uh, in my intro, it was mentioned that I'm working with IEEE on creating a recommended, recommended um, practice for the provenance of indigenous people's data. Um, we're really concerned about making sure to include attribution, provenance, permissions, um, and protocols within data landscapes. And one of the tools that's already out there that um, has been working towards this are the traditional knowledge, um, which are, are um, long, over a decade long instituted um, digital tags. Um, these labels um, can be placed, are placed by communities on their data. Um, and then now in development are biocultural labels, which apply to biocultural data. Um, and these labels also, um, can, are placed by communities on their data within the, um, the data infrastructure and live through um, the data life cycle with those. Um, there's more information at localcontext.org if you've not heard about them. Um, they're a fascinating tool in terms of metadata. Um, 
Another thing that I wanted to briefly mention is that there's, we've seen increased movement around um, recognizing intellectual property. Um, one of the ways that we've seen that's been moving kind of quickly lately, lately is through authorship and acknowledgement. Um, I remember when I did my dissertation five years ago, um, I was attempting to include a positionality statement about the authorship of the paper. And I got a lot of pushback from not only my committee and some of the co-authors of the paper, but also um, where we had submitted it to. And um, just this past week, what we've seen um, is a real beginning shift um, of a call out to um, publishers and others to begin to shift this practice of how we include ind indigenous authors in authorship. And so, um, some academic journals are including relevant statements that ultimately affect whether a publication is considered or not um, for publication. And so we've seen this come out, in, uh, for instance, like CoData, um, their data science journal put forth a statement around ind indigenous authorship and recognizing indigenous community involvement in publication. Um, and this new publication that's come out from three rural health journals, um, has looking had the the co-authors came together to declare their intention to publish nothing about indigenous peoples without indigenous peoples. Um, the paper that came out called um, Icarus, which is Indigenous Cultural Identity of Research Authors Standard, so they're setting a standard for health research publications, details how authors should be um, vetted and and included in publications. Um, if they are indigenous and the, the types of responsibilities that then journals have for the processes of doing this. So setting up um, policies, setting up processes, um, and then also being able to assess how they're moving forward with making sure that they are including indigenous authorship when we're talking about indigenous knowledge or indigenous communities. Um, and if there is not indigenous authorship, that it is intentional on the part of the community or the authors that were participating in that. Um, and so one of the things that they've put forth is the indication of indigenous um, uh, community belonging within the um, authorship um, citation. And so you see that happening here in their citation. Uh, one of the other real issues that we have, particularly in the US, but you see this in other countries, is that a lot of our laws and, and, and policies around research really focus on the individual. And so um, we protect human subjects um, through institutional review boards. And um, really, you know, um, focusing on um, Western conceptions of you know, individualism and really um, failing to account for collective rights, values, and community centered perspectives in the research process. Um, and so, uh, one of the things that has come out recently in a um, publication by Parker and all is really a big, a path forward for obtaining community approval. And I'll talk to this a little bit more in a minute, but um, one of the ways of, um, of doing this is embedding them within your system. So for instance, at the University of Arizona, if I'm putting in a proposal and I'm working with an indigenous community, I have to, I have to show that I'm actually working with them by, by attaching some sort of community approval um, so that um, it is known that I've made those connections. So I have, Three more recommendations. Um, one of the next one that I'll speak to is formalizing guidelines. Um, and so this can happen at a macro or a micro level. What we have seen around formalization of care, especially be fair and care, so linking fair and care together, is that um, the, the uptake within the United Nations. So in 2019, uh, the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Privacy may set forth recommendations on the protection and use of health-related data that include Indigenous data sovereignty and the care principles. More recently, the end of last year, last year the UNESCO recommendation on open science also includes um, rec recommendations around um, applying fair and care. And then um, we've seen some traction within um, uh, countries such as uh, Australia and New Zealand. Um, the uh, Australia IATSIS Code of Ethics for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Research specifically details the rights that Indigenous peoples have to their data um, and the need to utilize fair and care in research practices and data practices with Indigenous peoples. And that code is now required for all research with Indigenous peoples um, in Australia. 
Another example of formalizing voluntary guidelines is our University of Arizona Research Data Repository. Um, if, if I want to, um, it, you are allowed to deposit indigenous data into that repository, but you must show that you've met all human subjects research consent requirements. So that's both our university IRB, but also any tribal IRBs. And then you have um, appropriate tribal designee approval for the deposit of data into um, this repository. Importantly, this policy points towards other institutional laws and guidelines, including um, pointing to tribal law and policy and the need to follow that, um, pointing to our Arizona Board of Regents, um, tribal consultation policy, and then our University of Arizona guidelines for tribal engagement. Um, this further underscores how one institution's policies become part of the scaffolding of institutional policies that push towards advancing indigenous rights and interests. Um, so fundamentally, this also underscores the need to engage cultural intellectual property policies, um, which is another um, effort towards this arena. Finally, um, there is a need to tra track data use and reuse as we make this call and are attending to the call for open data, open science, and, and so forth. We must also make the uses of those data open. We must be able to understand who is using them how they're using them, and if their use is aligning with indigenous expectations in this case. Um, and that is one way um, forward in terms of being able to um, harness and understand the plethora of data that's out there, and then beginning to put forth how we're going to manage those data into the future. So as we come into this place where um, we have um, this huge, not, not only plural, proliferation of data, but proliferation of um, programming and software and all of that other stuff to process data, to mine data, to and to, to house data, um, we have to think about how our ethics um, and particularly um, ethics to data um, in this big data landscape haven't evolved as well. And so where are the perspectives and the input of the communities most impacted? Um, where are the spaces for sovereign nations or those don't um, to exercise uh, their authority and begin to participate? Um, and then thinking through, um, you know, how are data rights human rights and how do we make sure that as we think about future use of data that we're really attending to the questions around um, who has the right to commercialize data? How can we ensure benefit sharing? How to include collective rights and interests? And all of these questions really are at the nascent stages of being addressed. Um, so finally, just to close, Indigenous data sovereignty and, and data governance links already exist um, across the Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the US, across disciplines, across sectors, and we're seeing more and more activity in other parts of, across other parts of the globe as well. Um, transforming institutions to operationalize indigenous data governance has begun, but much, there's much left to do. Um, indigenous data sovereignty and governance provide huge opportunities to catapult institutions into doing research differently with and for not on behalf of and really doing innovative research. And finally, if there are trade offs to be made, meaning around open data, and it involves indigenous data, the decision making lies with indigenous communities. Thanks so much, Stephanie, for that great presentation. We very much appreciate it. Um, I'm going to transfer it over to Jocelyn um, for her presentation, and then we'll have time um, for questions. Thanks for all the great questions that folks are adding to the Etherpad. Um, I think we're going to have a really great discussion. So um, Jocelyn, we'll hand it over to you. All right, uh, can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so hi, I'm Jocelyn Lee, and I'm excited to be co-presenting here today. Um, you can tweet at me, I'm at theoretical fun um, here. Okay, and I use she, her, hers as my pronouns. Uh, so yat esh a Jocelyn Lee initia, Laguna Pueblo Big Parrot Nishle Do Todogoje Bashishin Ado Hakama Pueblo Little Badger Dasha Che Do Ashi Dashanelli. Uh Goatsi Jocelyn Lee Shawahanutsa Ed Wipi Rich Tea. Uh 
Uh, so I introduced myself in my traditional uh, languages of Keras, which is the Southwest tribes representing um, 19 of our Pueblos. So I am intertribal with Laguna and Acoma Pueblo. And in Navajo, Diné um, is uh, my other uh, tribal association. And this is how we introduce ourselves. Uh, so I didn't know if anyone <laughs> would be in the audience that I'm related to, but as I practice as a scientist, researcher, educator, I always want to try to build relationships with folks and connect. Uh, so I'll go ahead and thank all the organizers and attendees, all of you who are coming from different time zones for attending this important topic, and also my collaborator, Stephanie, Dr. Stephanie Carroll. Uh, so I come from Fort Lewis College. I'm currently traveling on my way to the airport right now. So I am not um, in Durango, Colorado, but just some background of where I come from. Uh, so this is our beautiful campus in the lower San Juan Mountains of Colorado. So if you're not too familiar, um, these this is the four corners of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona. Um, I specifically chose to take a faculty position at Fort Lewis College just so I could uh, engage with our large population of indigenous students. Um, and Fort Lewis College is situated on the ancestral land and territory of the Nuchu Ute people who were forcibly removed by the United States government. Uh, we also acknowledge that this land is connected to the communal and ceremonial spaces of the Hickory Apache, Apache, Pueblos of New Mexico, Hopi, Sonoma, Hopi, and Diné Navajo nations. It's important to acknowledge this setting because the narratives of the land in this region have long been told from dominant perspectives without full recognition of the original land stewards who continue to inhabit and connect with this land. Thank you for your attention and respect in acknowledging this important legacy. Uh, so I like to pull my uh, audience. Thank you, Kari, Kari. Um, and you can put this in the chat. I just like to see how many folks know um, how many federally recognized tribes in the US are there? Okay, so we have one of 250. <laughs> All right, so we're getting higher numbers, lower numbers. That's fine. I'll give some folks a few seconds to type this out. All right, so we got a few going from uh, at least in the um, above three or four, so that's great. All right, so I'll go ahead and show the next uh, slide. Uh, so currently, as of 2000, I think it was 19, uh, I've gotten this data. There are 574 uh, indigenous Native American or Indian tribes that are recognized in the 48 states and Alaska. Uh, so the map on the right shows the lands that are currently what we call reservations or recognized lands with the tribes. Uh, so this is something that I think is helpful to understand why I like to share our land acknowledgement, trying to understand what land is connected to and how that also connects to communities. And I think uh, Stephanie did a wonderful job highlighting and uh, hopefully sharing why this connection to land data uh, communities is greatly impactful. As you can look at the map, you'll see people are represented in many of our states. And some of the land is very small just because of all of the um, governance that has come with it. But uh, we're still here as uh, tribal people. And some folks like me are intertribal that represent multiple tribal affiliations. Uh, so as we move into this, I want to share sort of how I ended up here. Uh, this is something that I think gives rise to why it's important to educate folks and get people to think of um, how we uh, want to engage 
and build a better connection on the representation of um, indigenous data sovereignty. Uh, so like um, it was shared earlier, I started out as a data science educator at Cold Spring Harbor Lab. Uh, this is the first time I helped with a software carpentry workshop in 2015. And I was part of Cyverse. So this is where I think most of you, if you're familiar with the Carpentries, have either met Jason Williams. Uh, he and I worked with Cyverse and trained many faculty, uh, graduate students, and others. Um, and in 2016, I was able to attend my first instructor training. And this was at U of F. And that's where I got connected with Greg White, uh, Dr. Tracy Till, and Dr. Ethan White. And these folks, I think, have been involved and the executive level for the Carpentries. During this time, I got recruited to work at Howard Hughes Medical Institute as a science educator. And I was thankful because I was able to still play a role within the Carpentries here. And one of the major organizations we connected with was the Society Advancing Chicanos and Native Americans in Science um, at the national conference level. Uh, so partnering with Cyverse, Galaxy and Data Carpentry were able to bring training, short scale, not the full two day, uh, to SACNIS. This is where I think we could target quite a bit of the graduate student postdoc level and some faculty to have them see the capability of this type of curriculum or a short course into uh, trying to get more representation uh, at this level. So we did this for a few years and then COVID happened. And also I started a faculty position. So in 2019, I wasn't able to uh, put as much time towards uh, getting this uh, set up. Um, but I started at Fort Lewis College in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. And that's where I currently am. Um, with all my collaboration and connections for how can we reach this uh, community that is underrepresented in scientific computing, um, I decided to join the Executive Council. I was nominated by folks. Um, during this time, I got to connect with folks uh, within the Executive Council and sort of identify what are areas that we can expand. Uh, still thinking globally about all of our communities and identifying what areas that are similar in the US for indigenous people, but also other spaces. Uh, once I ended that, I again got recruited to the Equity Council with Dr. Uh, Carrie Jordan, and we had our first virtual summit and trying to understand what are some of the barriers and what can come from um, still connecting with these communities and not only on the diversity, equity, inclusion um, training material, but um, how can we still build this type of community uh, that's inclusive and accessible? Because uh, I work at a primary undergrad institute at Fort Lewis College. Uh, we don't have a formal um, bioinformatics computational biology, but we have the student demographic who can make up um, our future workforce. Um, so then that is where I joined up with uh, Stephanie to look at the Indigenous Data Sovereignty Collaboration, uh, just because that's one avenue to add more of an uh, Indigenous lens uh, for the Carpentries in general. Uh, so as I think about this path and where we can go to, um, in 2010, I was a graduate student at Northeastern University. I was in the Department of Chemistry there, and at that point in my life, I've only met one Indigenous Native PhD and faculty with computational experience, and that was my graduate school advisor, Professor Mary Jo Andrigan. She's from the New York area representing the Mohawk tribe. Uh, so again, I jumped into a computational lab. I had no formal training, um, sort of self-taught and uh, given code to <laughs> work on with other grad students. I think that's the story that a lot of people have. And I felt like I was completely out of my scope just because uh, the number of women in this area is very underrepresented and uh, people of color also underrepresented. And here's just some data and numbers and why I'm at the educational level and wanting to uh, bring light to 
um, Indigenous and American Indian Alaska Native. So from 20, um, 2009, I always said 2019, 2009 to 2018, um, the average doctoral recipient, this is from the National Science Foundation, is roughly on average 125 uh, Native Americans that re receive a PhD in all fields of study. Uh, so this is broken down by demographic. And I looked at data from when I graduated with my PhD in 2014. And when you start breaking down by fields of study, um, we have here the American Indian Alaska Native is 0.3% for all fields. So when we look at that value, um, we look at 103 PhDs in all fields of study. Once you get into chemistry, uh, that breaks down to 0.4%, which is around six uh, PhDs in chemistry that year. And these numbers, I knew four of the others <laughs> that got uh, their PhD with me. We were all in different areas of chemistry. Um, and then when you look into computer and informational science, um, sorry, that breaks down to four PhDs. So why I'm bringing these numbers are who are the folks that are going to create the content help in the faculty role uh, to educate our demographic of students who aren't represented in this field. And I haven't looked at the current numbers um, as of now, if that is the consistent trend, um, but it is alarming as I think about how do we diversify the workforce. Um, and then this is only in one area. This is my area of expertise is looking at genomic data science. Um, how can we expand to Hispanic serving institutions, historical black colleges, tribal colleges and universities, um, those folks who voices and connections to data um, just isn't as available. Uh, so I've gone through quite a bit of iterations on starting at the high school level, undergraduate, and also training faculty. So this is a paper that uh, just came out last month um, with our group of the Genomic Data Science Community Network. Um, how do we identify these opportunities and broaden access to uh, those who are interested in genomic data science? But as you can see with Stephanie's talk, this expands so many levels um, on what we need to represent. So this gets into how we can start to build a training program. Uh, so the Carpentries with the um, Equity Council is looking to support a network of not just indigenous researchers, but others to uh, increase data science training. Um, so again, coming back to folks with Cyverse that I worked with a long time ago, I was connected with uh, Dr. Nirav Merchant and Dr. Stephanie Carroll. They're both at U of A. And they proposed to design an indigenous data sovereignty and governance workshop. Um, so again, as Stephanie highlighted the fair and care, uh, a lot of this is missing in some of our data science training. Um, I try to build in my own curriculum for when I teach about this non carpentries, but uh, other avenues of chemistry. Um, how do we start to consider this when it's not as recognized in most common academic spaces? So we thought about a short course after I was brought on, and then we have other folks who have also joined, um, Dr. Crystal Sosi, she's currently an assistant professor at Arizona State University. We have two awesome other folks, Andrew Martinez and Jewel Cummins, and they are both um, helping us to figure out uh, the content, what it looks like, what are some of the items that have come up for concern as we shift into the space. So on our early observations, we wanted to reflect on our community of practice. So when we think about this, we wanted to find ways to engage indigenous students and then also identify needs for those who don't identify as indigenous, um, whether they're students, I guess I should put it in here, learners, um, but what are things that we need to start to consider um, that may not already be developed, but also what um, our students know about this space. So there are different areas of focus we wanted to start to identify, indigenous data sovereignty, artificial intelligence, 
ethics, tribal data governance, and indigenous data governance. So those are different because of the, uh, again, we go back to those federally recognized tribes who has the opportunity to um, enforce some of these, whether they're on tribal land or not, or if we're thinking about nations that are not US centric, what do they have for their, their data governance? So after we started to categorize what areas to focus on, we had to think about, is there any known curricula already out there? What things are developed? Where are things we can not rebuild um, initially, but sort of build upon or see how things we can, uh, I don't wanna say indigenize in the space, but um, have that indigenous lens to uh, either complement or maybe even correct some of that uh, observation. So we're able to start looking at these areas because it's a large net <laughs> to cast on all these topics. So then if we have our curricula, how do we distribute this and how do we start to build training modules as a short course or a workshop? Um, and this is where I came in of proposing a carpentry style approach because I think the um, lessons that you work through and the way that you can distribute is very flexible. So that brought up some areas of concerns and we've been talking about this for the last, I would say seven months on how to come up with solutions with the carpentries. Uh, so some of our concerns have been on the lines of should this be open access, make sure it's not for profit, um, what are some of the licensing that can come with this. Because uh, as you know, if, if you're familiar with some of our lessons uh, for the carpentries, they abide by the Creative Commons Attribution License, CCBY. Uh, but we understand some people can credit this, but can choose to adapt. And this could affect sort of the outcome of the actual training. And how can we try to keep folks from violating this license? Uh, so there have been a lot of discussions on what content should we uh, describe, what content should we go deeper in because we want folks to be cognizant of this indigenous data sovereignty. And then as more people are trained, you know, how do we consider folks for editing? Um, and I think in our space, GitHub with version control and maintainers, uh, this is one way we can look at who's able to develop the content, but also contribute and review those contributions. So that wasn't as uh, too huge a concern. Um, but we know maintainers, it's a big task to take on. And the other side of it, if those who feel confident in this field, but do they understand all the cultural specificity that comes with this? Are they aware of the tribal governance and differences within the US or even the worldview of this? So how can we choose maintainers who can man monitor this um, once we get people trained? Um, do we think they are able to contribute at a level that isn't harmful to any of our communities? And that's more or less just module development. So we've had discussions on how can we choose who can teach. Um, anyone can take these lessons and teach them under the current licensing. And would we be at fault if someone takes the lessons and teaches them in a way that's disrespectful? Um, and we've talked about teaching badges, but this is one concern on how we can uh, not harm our communities. Um, so then we got into discussions of example data sets. Um, we can choose public data that isn't harmful that people have already worked with. Um, one thing when we think about uh, indigenous populations, if we're looking at data available, some of the sample size can be small. Um, who has access to the data and who can share the story behind that data. Um, and we didn't even get into the community perspective of if people are looking at this type of training data or example data set, um, do they even know about the community and the people associated with it? So there was a lot, I think, in the last couple of months that have been really mind opening for me, uh, things that even I uh, don't consider myself as um, involved with taking a huge step back just because of my academic training, um, I forget things. So even with that indigenous perspective, it's helped me um, to take a step back on a few things I've been doing um, 
and trying to figure out what is language to use. Um, how can we keep this again in a world centric mindset because that's what the carpentries is also representing. Uh, so our timeline has been again in the last uh, year that we've come up with um, some really exciting focus areas. Uh, but hopefully this fall we can continue to work on some content development and really finding data that's uh, relevant that folks who are learning in the space um, make some definitions, uh, discussion points, so it's more of an engaging uh, type of learning. And then how can we start to integrate this into the carpentries and then pilot instructional material for others to use. So this is this side of the talk is more of a like take a step back hear what we're working on, but it is, again, thinking about the care and fare that we have um, here. And I think um, one thing that I thought I added, uh, some of the um, modules that are already there are the libraries carpentries. Um, they have the uh, fair, the strategies. So that's one thing that we've been thinking about, how can we uh, model uh, but build upon that because I think that lesson uh, set of lessons is really uh, impactful uh, that I haven't taught, but I am excited to go through that training also. Uh, so that's what I have for now, um, and I can go ahead and give it back to Alicia and then we can look at some of the questions. Great, thanks so much, Jocelyn, for that wonderful presentation. Um, we've been getting a lot of really great questions um, in the chat. Um, I know several individuals had more than one question, so I um, want to move around a little bit so that I can um, uh, uh, get questions from everyone that has asked them. Uh, again, if you would like, feel free to add additional questions um, into the Etherpad or add them to the chat. Um, uh, Stephanie and Jocelyn, I'm going to add the questions that I'm asking you into the chat as well so you can reference them. Um, but the first question is um, what are some initial steps individual researchers can do to bring awareness of care principles to their research groups or institutions? I could speak, but I'm actually interested in what Jocelyn has to say as um, somebody who's, uh, you know, has been um, implementing and, and thinking about this from a user perspective. And then I can give some reflection on that. Um, yeah, I think for this, um, it's a hard one. I think some folks are either in their bubble that they don't want to start considering diversity or um, history of people. I think it's a complex thing for them. I always try to have people have cultural reflexivity thinking about their background. Because um, as you start to study other demographics or groups, I think people just go by either NIH or NSF uh, categories versus really thinking about these people as humans. Um, and that's not only the thing in an indigenous lens, um, studying plants, studying animals, they're all relatives as a indigenous value for me. And I hold them with a similar respect as humans. So as people start to study um, organisms, it is a whole nother area that I don't think they're aware of. When you talk about seed banks, um, these are actually living things and you know, people don't understand that connection at times. Um, so there's a lot of scope, uh, I think, for me being on the genetics genomic side that is alarming. And um, I wish a lot of researchers and institutions had the care principles to um, have them see uh, and maybe encourage more um, uh, people of color or indigenous people to um, want to be in these areas of research. I think those are really um, fundamental points, Jocelyn. I think, you know, and in the US, but also internationally, <clears throat> in most places, 
practices, there's very little understanding and recognition of indigenous peoples. And so the, the, um, there's, there's always the pre-learning that has to take place before you can even be introduced to the concepts around data, right? So a lot of the work that, that um, Jocelyn did with you today about introducing like who are federally recognized indigenous peoples in the US. And then uh, I think it was Aaron in the comment box said something about native Hawaiians. Well, they're not federally recognized nor are indigenous people in um, the US territories. And so there's many layers, but the work that we do really hinges upon um, inherent sovereignty that indigenous peoples have that, that is recognized within the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So kind of learning that history, I think is, is foundational and important. Um, just being able to introduce the concepts of the care principles. And I, you know, what I've seen over the past, I don't know, seven years or so, when I, I finished my dissertation in 2015, and one of my papers in my dissertation was on indigenous data sovereignty. And my committee basically told me that they didn't think anybody would publish it, um, which was ironic because it had been invited as a paper to a journal already. Um, but it just, it just um, underscores the lack of awareness around these issues. And these were all people who had worked in indigenous communities. And so what we've seen over the past seven years is really this groundswell of where you couldn't talk about these subjects before, they're now being invited into those spaces. Um, and so being able to think about um, how do you introduce the care principles, um, just as a, you know, a simple basic conversation in terms of inserting them into content um, and into discussions around um, not only the ethics, because while care seems like it widely applies to ethics, which it does, we have to think about it in terms of um, how should it be front-ended to be able to influence the design um, of cyber infrastructure, right? And um, all of those initial steps that cannot be done in the right way <laughs> in terms of creating and using um, and, um, and requiring, for instance, metadata, right? If you don't create the space for it, where are you gonna put it? Um, and so being able to make sure that it, there's an understanding, it's not just, just an ethics discussion. Great, thanks to you both. Um, I'm adding another question into the chat from someone. Um, I had heard about traditional knowledge labels before, but not biocultural labels. Can you tell us more about those? Sure, so um, local contexts um, created the traditional knowledge labels, like I said, a, a while ago. They've been in use across the, uh, across the globe by a number of indigenous communities. And over the past probably three or four years now, um, there's been an effort to develop um, the biocultural labels. So the traditional knowledge labels deal with um, some foundational aspects of um, inserting metadata. And so things like attribution, how should the, how should the data be attributed? Um, but then also deal with things about um, I, I told the story about different times, if, whether or not data should be included or released or shared at different types of times of year, there's traditional knowledge labels for that. Now, the biocultural lab labels expand on that um, because they work around um, cultural rights and responsibilities um, for um, future sharing and use of the material or data um, when it is, um, generated from biodiversity or genetic resources associated with traditional lands, waters, and territories. Um, and so those labels, um, if you go to lo localcontext.org, actually there's a really good video um, that I recommend on that site um, that um, describes the labels and the, um, and the notices there. Um, and I think we can put the local context link in, but I actually have the link to the video I can put into the chat too as well. Um, and so those are being um, developed and tested um, primarily in um, New Zealand right now, but in, in some other places as well. Uh, and to add on that, you know, I think um, some of the nations themselves have IRB. So how can you release some of this data? and um, how is it shared? How is it accessible? Uh, so that's one thing I think these labels help um, identify if you're on tribal lands, where did you collect it? And who um, within the government, whether it's tribal 
Um, in Navajo, we have chapter houses. So how do you help get that information back to your community center as a chapter house or uh, the tribal leaders as they rotate through? Are they aware about the research that's going on within their community and then from the greater level if you think about the size of Navajo Nation um, how many of those communities are represented so I think this is a key point um, to also highlight. I'm going to add another question into the chat that came in that is somewhat similar to that first question but a little bit more carpentries focused. Um, is in Carpentry's workshops, we encounter researchers at various points in their experience with research and data. Are there one or two key ideas that would be most useful to convey to people during training to help prepare them to address care principles, either as it applies to data they are currently working with, or as it may apply to their future experience in data acquisition or reuse? I think one of the first things that I had on my agenda when I when I started doing this work really was to um, raise individual awareness so that people can come to the table and um, make other people aware of that Indigenous peoples exist, that we've been here a very long time, that we have relationships and roles and responsibilities um, for how we care for our knowledge that really translate well into um, a digital environment, and that's a really interesting concept because you're not you're not um, creating um, something new. I had a tribal leader tell me very early on um, when I was doing this work that we're making what's old new again, and so um, it's really important to understand that a lot of these ideas, though people are intimidated by talking about data. Um, that these roles and responsibilities already exist. And so from a non-Indigenous perspective, to have people at the baseline awareness to be able to be sitting there, um, whether they're in a research group um, or whether they're working on a proposal for NSF um, or they're in a large conference, to be able to question and say, oh, did you, did you think about um, Indigenous considerations for those data? Or did you think about the indigenous peoples or engage with the indigenous peoples from whose lands and territories you took those sample from? Um, and so that is to me the foundation of beginning the conversation is, is creating a cadre of individuals who when they're in those environments say, hey, nobody said anything about indigenous people. Um, and especially um, you know, when you're thinking about the considerations of how we're caring for data. Uh, to add on to that, I think the same thing goes for like the traditional knowledge. I know in chemistry this happens quite a bit. People will find out about a plant and want to study it and it's like, wait, take a step back. Like who shared that knowledge? Was that knowledge supposed to be shared at that level? And you know, if you're going to patent it, that's not probably the best thing to do. So there have been a lot Lot of um, incidences that I think happen with uh, many indigenous communities on should we even allow researchers on the land? How do we um, safe keep ourselves so that we aren't taken advantage of? Um, so that's one thing I'll add more on the um, side, which then generates some of the data. And it's like Stephanie said, did you have that initial discussion? Um, what was that relationship? And then also is this helicopter uh, research that's happening. So what's the reprocessity with the communities that you're um, getting this information or items from? Thanks. Um, there was a question um, related to the licensing that I am adding into the chat. It seems someone was asking about a Creative Commons license as a possible option, and I think that relates to some of the content that you had discussed, Jocelyn, in your presentation. Um, I can add a little bit to this as well. Um, as the Carpentries has been working um, with uh, Stephanie and Jocelyn and um, the other team members that Jocelyn mentioned, 
in one of her earlier slides. And we did reach out to a legal um, consult to learn a little bit more about um, licensing options and also how um, licensing is enforced um, internationally. And so that's been a big part um, of the conversation as we've been um, collaboratively working towards developing some of these materials. Um, but I'll, I'll see if um, Jocelyn or Stephanie would like to add anything to that. Uh, so yeah, so this we've talked about, uh, yes, we want to bring folks to learn more about this. So um, we've considered, you know, what areas do we need to um, generate some sort of licensing? We have talked about publishing this so that there is more of a um, citation that's associated to this, um, but we know that people are gonna take the training. So how can we start to uh, consider these? So I haven't looked at the NDNC licensing yet, but that's something I think we can take back and discuss. Great, thanks, Jocelyn. So I'm going to add another question to the chat. Um, so how can non-Indigenous researchers start to build relationships with Indigenous peoples who may be invested in the research questions? So I'm trying to find a paper um, that was published in Nature last year. And I think it has some key points to start. So I'll share that in the chat. Um, this is like I was referring to meaningful collaborations, avoiding helicopter research, um, taking time to learn of who's living there. Uh, there might be people already doing research um, that have been welcomed by the community. Uh, so I think that's one thing is just learning about who's there, what space you're in. Um, don't make any assumptions. Uh, meet as many people as you can. And this is something that um, I always try to get to know the community I'm working with because I've worked in many uh, states. Um, trying to not push my research interest, but getting to know what the community is passionate about. And if it doesn't fit my interest, you know, I can still help with training and educational level. Uh, things may not be published. People don't want to publish results, or maybe they want data on an area that um, isn't as understood on what's happening for um, some field sites. So I think there are ways that it's just getting to know the local community, um, understanding their needs, and just listening to folks. Jocelyn, you said that well. I have another question I'm adding into the chat. Um, so the Carpentries community is, in my experience, very interested in making educational resources that are open and inclusive of various learner communities, including BIPOC learners. Both of the speakers mentioned they are interested in some data science teaching initiatives in Indigenous communities. How do they think the Carpentries can develop more useful, ethical, welcoming educational opportunities and resources, workshops with and for these Indigenous communities? Oh, you can start, Stephanie. <laughs> um, I was going to say, I'm always so stymied by these questions because I feel like, um, you know, you saw Jocelyn's uh, portrayal of the numbers, right? So our numbers are really, really low and people are overtaxed. Um, and so being able to make uh, these experiences um, be not only a single engagement type and a single specific issue, um, in terms of being able to provide um, mentoring and connection and relationships, I think is really, really important. Um, and being able to um, do that over time. And so I know that there's been, uh, Jocelyn talked about work with SACNAS. There's um, other efforts going ongoing with other um, organizations and, and communities. I think 
really one of the things that that's hardest, um, but the best method is really through individual relationships and being able to move forward the work um, in a way that um, builds that um, trust in the organization. Um, and I think that's beginning to happen. Um, you know, Justin's been working with the Carpentries for a while. I've known about the Carpentries for a while and actually kind of watched the Carpentries to see if it was a place that I actually wanted to be engaged with. Um, and that could be um, a useful relationship in terms of moving um, not only specific indigenous content forward, but broader content around data science and um, libraries and software through indigenous communities. And so being able to, uh, I really think, make these connections that um, Jocelyn has had and expand those to people like Crystal Sosi and myself, but then particularly to make sure that we're training people um, and moving them through the process of um, becoming part of um, the carpentries in terms of knowledge um, and being able to share that moving forward is incredibly important. Jocelyn, you've been at this longer. Yeah, I think it's uh, having a safe space to learn. I've always gravitate, gravitated towards that. If there's an area that people are just talking at you and not listening, then I tend to avoid those spaces and so do other folks. So I think it's just being mindful, building those relationships, generating a welcoming environment. And I think that also a uh, reciprocity of connecting with folks. So you learn a little bit about them. So I always share my culture whenever I feel safe. So in that aspect, um, that's when some material can start to get built by those even though maybe they don't have a PhD, but um, learning about each other and their cultures, I think is very important. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, I'm adding another question into the chat. Um, what are the data types that are most prone to being overlooked as needing recognition of Indigenous connections? I think all data are in peril, but I think particularly understanding how we make connections with um, environmental data and non-human data to indigenous communities is, is really, really important. Um, and it's, um, you know, there's been significant disconnection of indigenous peoples from their data for centuries now. Um, and like there are literally bunkers filled with information about indigenous peoples and our environments. Um, but I, I really think it's, uh, and I think Jocelyn kind of spoke about this a little bit and when she was talking during her presentation is that there isn't a firm understanding about how um, to conceptualize the relationships that indigenous people have with lands and territories and, and non-humans and what that means in terms of data. Um, and not only what that means in terms of persistent relationships, but what happens when you extract knowledge from its knowledge base um, and from its knowledge system. Um, those are really critical considerations that I think are really just starting to be explored from a Western science perspective. Um, and also to add to that, I think just the story behind the data, I think people will start to look at numbers, make correlations without thinking of the impact um, and whether that also is shared back with the community. I'm adding a comment that someone put into the etherpad into the chat because it was just related to your comment just now, Jocelyn. It said, thank you for including who can share the story behind the data. This is often forgotten or left out due to lack of time for many types of da data and seems even more important to these examples. Um, we have a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna add another one into the chat. This is a long one. Um, I don't know, Jesse, if you want to unmute yourself to ask this question. You don't have to. I, I can ask it. Uh, sure, I, I could. Um, I guess um, 
and it's kind of coming from personal experience, but I think very um, related to many of the things you've both been talking about. I've worked in a couple of repositories, uh, libraries and archives that have holdings of materials that either document indigenous communities or were created and subsequently extracted from them in many of the backstories that you've alluded to. So I really agree uh, with the observation that high level policy and models are critical, um, which I think you both gave such wonderful examples of. And I, I particularly appreciated the attention to metadata for you know actually implementing and describing um, some of these properties. But um, in my experience, it's been uh, difficult to do that, especially I'm thinking here in the technical side of things in libraries and archives. So just to give one example, um, at the Library of Congress, we were able to implement and add TK labels to existing catalog records. Um, it was a very long process and a very rewarding process. Um, uh, but it, it wasn't just uh, because of the necessary relationships with the communities to build. It was also because the technical properties of the records. So we were talking about things like mark records, which are widely used in libraries to describe materials, don't have easy places to put things um, that weren't there when they were designed. And so I... Um, uh, just wonder what your experience or advice may be in implementing these kind of technical interventions into existing systems and or if you have any other examples or suggestions to kind of um, help on that end uh, of technical implementation. This is a really important question, but also I'm super biased because this is the area that I that I work in. Um, and so there's so many places where you can work around indigenous data sovereignty and data governance. Um, my thing of the moment is really repositories. And I think, you know, the first the first caution is that if you know anybody creating a new repository, we, you know, we really need to work with them to make sure that they're creating um, from the start with with all of these in mind. Um, so that they don't have to go through the painful <laughs> actions that you've just so aptly described. Um, so there's a there's a couple there's a couple care specific um, activities moving forward. Um, the Neon Repository was just funded um, to come up with a plan for how to implement um, the care principles with across their across their repositories. And so that's an NSF funded project, an NSF funded repository um, to move ahead with that. Um, we're also creating a repository user group with funding from the, the Loose Foundation to think about um, these two avenues. One is one is the you know the guidelines and policies pieces and the other piece is the technical infrastructure. So for instance like our, our repository at the University of Arizona uses Big Share. Um, can't, what you just described is the problem we have. Um, so how do we either work with Big Share, who's themselves overtaxed, or um, create a process to add on to Big Share that other users of Big Share could also use to be able to um, be able to um, increase the metadata, right? And then also attend to a lot of the other issues that come out in the policies and practices. Um, thank you, Alicia, for putting me on in there. Um, I know that there's a lot of other interest in, um, for instance, when, when NSF put out the, their FARO, so, so FAIR Open Science um, Research Coordination Network call, a lot of those places, they explicitly stated in the call, they were looking for some places to talk about care within, um, within those practices. And a lot of them were thinking about it from the perspective of repositories and how you begin to do that. The other thing is the Earth Science Information Partners um, has been going through a process of how to um, set forth guidelines for implementing trusts, which are the repository specific principles, fair and care. Um, and so um, we're due to, to work on the end of this year on, on issuing those specifically around care. Um, for repositories, um, but that technical aspects is, is one of the most difficult pieces because uh, it's like once you get past the hump of convincing people that they need to do it, then you run into that huge wall of how to do it. Um, and so there are, other, there are other places, and, and for instance, the University of Tasmania has decided to use um, the labels um, and notices throughout their systems at the university. And so they're, they're, re, um, they're rebuilding 
um, all of their pieces so that they include, can include those in their commitment to open access and um, open data and all those components. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jesse, for your question. Um, there's one more question, and then um, we have about seven minutes left um, with uh, the um, chat today. And so I wanted to have a little bit of time um, for us to kind of reflect on maybe some next steps that we all can take as individuals um, to help build the care principles into the work that we are doing. Um, before that, though, I, I wanted to bring up this last question here that I added into the chat. Um, do the speakers see any limits to the care fair principles? That is, are they applicable only to research data that may document indigenous communities or to other types of collections more generally? Um, are there implementations of care approaches, for example, in museums, herbaria, seed banks, botanical gardens, natural history repositories, et cetera? So I would say that uh, care and fair isn't just for indigenous communities, just thinking about the world around us. Um, I think this could be a shift within science if we really took these um, and applied them to all communities, not just uh, certain types that I think this question is referring to. Um, but yeah, all the collections I think people forget, they think this could just be for humans, but as you start to look at all the, um, like this highlighted seed banks, botanical gardens, um, historical items that are found that are still related to some space or people, group of people. Um, I think that this has so much application, um, but I don't think it's just limited to indigenous communities. Yeah, I would agree. I think um, it's been interesting because when we first talk, started talking about indigenous data sovereignty in mainstream community, data communities, people would think about and talk about how well it was applicable to marginalized other marginalized communities and and things like that. And then as soon as we um, released the care principles, there was immediate attention, particularly from Europe, um, where they were beginning to already deal with and grapple with the, the complexities of having a very individual centric um, focus and then merging into how do you deal with collectives, right? And so really what indigenous data sovereignty and the care principles have done is really push thinking in the mainstream outside of just digital, right? Because almost anything can be digitized. And so how do we make sure we're thinking about how do we perpetuate relationships that are outside of digital within digital environments? Um, thinking outside of just, um, Ge ge geographic jurisdictional boundaries. How do we maintain those relationships outside of the, the boundaries that were existing within, for instance, data sovereignty mainstream? Um, and then how do we deal with and attenuate to collective interests, right? Is, especially when um, you might not have the right pieces of it that you have. So indigenous, um, we have to think back and think about how indigenous um, peoples and indigenous rights really has transformed um, data environments to be able to think about all these concepts differently. So jurisdiction differently to think about um, what, what really is data and what do we mean by data and how are we inclusive of knowledges and belongings and all of those things. And then how do we think about collective rights within those spheres. And so being able to um, influence and change systems is really important and so you you like you can literally see that if you think about what um jesse was talking about in terms of like changing um the the infrastructure that you're dealing with creating creating virtual space right um for metadata and the other piece is we don't want to on the flip side of it stifle indigenous innovation because where these ideas came from there are many more so how do we make sure we're engaging with indigenous um, scholars and bringing up um, our indigenous youth to be in these places? Because um, while the, the, well, indigenous data sovereignty and governance innovations have come from and are born from um, indigenous knowledge systems, there's so much more there that can contribute. 
Well, thank you both so much. Um, I want to give you a round of applause for great presentations. Um, I did want to take these last couple of minutes um, uh, to uh, basically have each of us think about um, what actions that we would like to take to apply the care principles in our work. So I'm adding a link to the Etherpad here um, so that everyone um, can take a minute um, to think about all that was discussed today and some various ways that we can um, take what we have learned and apply it into the work that we're doing. As an international community, I think that there's a lot that we can do to engage in this conversation, um, not um, just through our workshops, but um, even with uh, uh, communications with our learners. And so um, just wanted us to uh, take a little bit of time to do that. And again, thank you so much, Jocelyn and Stephanie for being with us today. Today. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, thank you all for joining us as well. Do add your response. I'm going to um, create a word cloud. I'll share share out with the community after after the session today. Um, we are at time, though. Our um, next session starts in um, 30 minutes. It's going to be a resource development sprint for our community coordinators. Um, so hopefully, some of you can join us. Um, and again, we'll be having sessions throughout the rest of the two weeks. Um, so I uh, would love to have you and hope to see some of you at those, um, those additional sessions. So thank you all so much. I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>